unidentified flying objects. Is it artificial? Is it a product of intelligence? Scientifically, we eliminate the simple hypothesis. It's not a plane. It's not a helicopter. It's not a natural phenomenon because the descriptions don't match. Therefore, this global phenomenon resists any other explanation. And the only other remaining hypothesis is the hypothesis of extraterrestrial origin. For the past 50 years, there have been allegations that governments have withheld information on the subject of UFOs. These days, the threat of torture has been replaced by ridicule. I mean, I used to work for the government, so I know that, you know, there are a lot of things that you cannot tell common man because it's not in his, within his realm to really understand what the big picture is. I think people have a right to know about it, but I don't, I'm not really sure that I believe. I don't think I can imagine. So, during the time of the communication, the press and so on, I can't imagine that they would really keep it on a secret for a long time. The UFO issue made the headlines on June 25, 1947, when Kenneth Arnold, a private pilot, reported seeing nine bright saucer-like objects flying at incredible speed near Mount Rainier. He described the objects flying like a saucer being skipped over water. It was then that the term flying saucer was coined. During the next two weeks, over a thousand sightings were reported throughout the country. In the summer of 1947, the 509th Bomb Group was the only squadron in the world entrusted with atomic weapons. The Enola Gay, infamous for dropping the atomic bomb over Hiroshima, Japan, was based here. On July 7, 1947, this elite squadron announced the recovery of a flying disc on a ranch near Roswell, New Mexico. Major Jesse Marcel, intelligence officer for the 509th Squadron, was among the first military personnel to arrive on the scene. I was amazed at what I saw. The amount of debris was scattered over such an area. But uh, the more I saw the fragments, the more I realized that uh, it wasn't anything that I, that I was acquainted with. In fact, as it turned out, nobody else was acquainted with it. There was foil no thicker than that in a pack of cigarettes, which was virtually indestructible, and pieces of I-beam with hieroglyphic-like markings that could not be read. Major Marcel took his report back to Roswell Army Airfield, along with bits of the wreckage. Colonel William Blanchard, commanding officer of the 509th, examined them both. He ordered public information officer, Walter Hout, to release word that the Roswell Army Airfield had recovered a flying disc. He then ordered Major Marcel to fly the wreckage to Wright Field in Ohio. En route, the plane was to stop at headquarters of the 8th Army Air Force in Fort Worth, Texas. Major Marcel was met at Fort Worth by General Roger Ramey, commanding officer of the 8th Air Force at Fort Worth Army Airfield. According to Marcel, General Ramey told him not to say anything to the waiting press. He then switched the debris Marcel had brought from New Mexico with a radar reflector and pieces of a conventional weather balloon. With the material in place, General Ramey then held a press conference. The Roswell Army Airfield was squeezed out by senior personnel and the record was sealed. If it was something of ours, uh, that was, I'm sure there would be no reason to keep it under cover that long. If it's an aerial spacecraft, there's another reason why it would not ever be known by anybody here un until they found out more about it. His son, Dr. Jesse Marcel Jr., remembers the night his father came home with the crash debris. 
people saying, well, that's a radar target. Well, he had radar training, and uh, he knew what a radar target looked like. And he would not have brought a radar target, you know, out of his way and wake my mother and myself up just to look at a piece of a radar target. We boxed the stuff back up, put it in the car, and took off for the base. And um, I didn't see him for a while. It was maybe later that afternoon, maybe it was the next day. I guess that was the time that he flew to, uh, to uh, Fort Worth with it. And when he came back, he was very adamant that uh, my mother and myself were never to discuss this, that uh, treat it like a non-event because it didn't happen. The U.S. Air Force's investigatory program was officially launched on January 2nd, 1948, under the code name of Project Sign. From the 243 cases studied, a report entitled An Estimate of the Situation was compiled by the Air Technical Intelligence Center. It concluded, flying saucers are probably real extraterrestrial spacecraft. Air Force Chief of Staff Hoyt Vandenberg found these conclusions unacceptable. He then ordered the Air Force to go out and find more earthly explanations. Project Sign then metamorphosed into Project Grudge. 244 cases were studied. It concluded, most reports of unidentified flying objects have been the result of persons failing to identify familiar phenomena such as reflections from bright surfaces in the day or lights in a night sky. In 1952, it finally became known as Project Blue Book. By now, the information gathered was being divided. That which was difficult to disprove disappeared, while sightings easily dismissed were made public. On February 28, 1960, the first director of the CIA, Roscoe H. Hillencotter, broke his silence in a statement published in the New York Times. He declared, it is time for the truth to be brought out in open congressional hearings. Behind the scenes, high-ranking Air Force officers are soberly concerned about the UFOs. But through official secrecy and ridicule, many citizens are led to believe the unknown flying objects are nonsense. He charged that to hide the facts, the Air Force has silenced its personnel through the issuance of a regulation. This was a secret time. America was obsessed with anti-communist sentiment, and there was great paranoia. To look on the brutal face of communism, Union Square in New York was the backdrop for these scenes of red violence. From their ranks will come the saboteurs, spies, and subversives, should World War III be forced upon America. In addition to this, Orson Welles had demonstrated 20 years earlier just how gullible Americans were and how easily the public stampeded with fatal results. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. It wasn't only America. In Europe, the military presence was under the direction of NATO, SHAPE. SHAPE was tracking a large number of UFOs on radar flying at high altitudes and great speeds over Central Europe and disappearing to the north. Their activities generated concern among military commanders as a possible threat from Russia. However, repeated demonstrations of advanced technology by these objects made it very clear to military authorities that these capabilities were far beyond anything that we or the Soviets had. At that point, SHAPE headquarters launched a three-year investigation to determine what these objects were. Their conclusions are still classified today. Robert Dean, former intelligence analyst at SHAPE, claims to have seen the report at NATO headquarters during the early 1960s. It was entitled, An Assessment. After all the material had been collected, they brought it together and they wrote the final report with all of the appendices and annexes. Then, at that time, they made a determination and a recommendation to General Lemnitzer, the American four-star general that I worked for. And they suggested, this is so sensitive, this reality is so delicate, 
the conclusions that we have reached, we believe could be essentially and substantially earth-shaking to the people unless they're prepared for it. We believe at this point that this should be given the highest classification NATO has, at that time was and still is, cosmic top secret. Evidently, not everyone agreed. While still in Congress, Gerald Ford sent a letter to L. Mendel Rivers, chairman of the Armed Services Committee, on March 28, 1966. I recommend that there establish credibility regarding UFOs and to produce the greatest possible enlightenment on this subject. In 1966, congressional hearings were held with Secretary of Defense Harold Brown and scientific advisor of Project Blue Book, Dr. J. Allen Hynek. What is the Air Force hiding in this investigation? We have not been hiding anything. The investigations have been made public. The explanations of those where there is a clear explanation have been made public. The hearing this morning was public for just that reason. None of the evidence that I have examined would indicate any proof at all uh, that we are being visited by extraterrestrials. Dr. J. Allen Hynek is one of the most important figures in this matter. As a senior government representative, he faithfully continued to dismiss all UFO sightings as swamp gas, mass hallucinations, temperature inversions, and conventional aircraft until Blue Book was terminated in 1969. However, four years later, he founded the Center for UFO Studies, which is still active today. In 1985, shortly before his death, he revealed that Project Blue Book had indeed misled the public. I was there at Blue Book, and I know the, the, the job they had. Uh, they were told not to excite the public. Uh, don't uh, rock the boat. Uh, and I saw it in my own eyes happen that whenever a case happened that they could explain, which is quite a few, they made point of that and, and uh, let that out to the media. Things that, the, the cases that were very difficult to explain, they would jump the handsprings to keep the, the media away from them. For their, they had a job to do, uh, to, whether rightfully or wrongly, to keep the public from getting excited. In December of 1984, a roll of unexposed film arrived by mail at the home of TV producer Jamie Chanderay. The contents revealed the existence of a super-secret committee formed in late 1947 to deal with the wreckage recovered near Roswell, New Mexico. Operation Majestic 12. The Majestic 12 were highly accomplished men, six military and six civilian. Sworn to secrecy, they were to analyze the physical evidence and learn about the motives and ultimate intentions of the occupants. There has been no official recognition of the Majestic 12 Committee, and there is controversy regarding the authenticity of some of the documents. However, records were found to suggest the contrary. UFO investigators Bill Moore, Jamie Chanderay, and Stanton Friedman spent over 11 years searching through 17 archives, sifting through a paper trail of over 250,000 pages of memos, flight logs and letters, the researchers concluded that a super secret committee did in fact exist. Nuclear physicist and UFO researcher Stanton Friedman wrote a book about his 12-year investigation, Top Secret Magic. We spoke with Friedman at the 50th anniversary of the Roswell incident. It's the list of 35 pieces of information not known to be true before we got the documents that turned out to be true afterward. I've had archivists tell me they couldn't have faked those documents because there was too much detail. Yeah, I've spent time, a lot of time, in 17 archives, uh, weeks at some of them. And I learned a lot about documents. I learned about variations in typefaces and styles. Uh, I learned that, for example, highly classified memos often are written which don't give you a clue if you see it, what it's about. Only the guy who gets it and the guy who sends it. No. Even though it was objected that in a top secret memo, according to Phil Class Truman, would have been very explicit. Exactly the opposite is true. You can see the perfect outline of a semicircular dome against the sky. I mean, it was big. 
it had the ability to, to move at a relatively slow rate of speed, and then when it decided to really go away, it went away quite quickly. It happened, but uh, what good is it to tell anybody? Four-time world land speed record holder Craig Breedlove is the first man to have traveled four, five, and then 600 miles per hour. In 1955, while walking on a beach with a friend, something caught his eye. And, uh, we both saw it, watched it come down uh, behind some clouds, come out the other side, stop, hover directly in front of us, and then it began to, to again to accelerate and it moved behind some more clouds, came out the other side and then just left the area at a very high rate of speed and there was no uh, apparent, you know, engines or there was no noise for one thing. Did it have lights? No, but it did ha didn't have lights, no lights at all, but it did have its own iridescence to it. I mean, it had like its own uh, l luminescence as if, I mean, it was very visible. I mean, neither one of us said anything, we just stared at it. Her first comment was to look at me and say, what was that? And I said, well, I think we just saw flying saucer. So that's it, end of story. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, thousands of people have seen them. Another noted figure is actor-director Bobby Carradine. He's spent much time investigating UFOs and the officially secret desert base in Nevada, known as Area 51, for a documentary film. We asked if he thought the government was covering up information regarding UFOs. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Uh, we talked to one individual who... Uh, will remain nameless, but he worked at the base for several years. And uh, his superiors have allowed him to tell us certain tidbits about his work. And one of the things that he told us was that he worked on a simulator for a flying saucer or a flying disc. Anytime uh, that you have a simulator, it means you've probably got the hardware. Uh, you always put your guys in the simulator first before you send them up in the hardware because you don't want to kill all your test pilots. So obviously, uh, if you're going to be flying discs, uh, you have to learn how to fly them in the safety of a simulator. And he worked on a simulator, and we find his, uh, his story to be uh, very compelling. But you know, everybody wants proof. We don't have any proof. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio was the original center for all of this material to be brought together. It was the headquarters for the Foreign Technology Division of the United States Air Force. It later became the headquarters for the Alien Technology Division of the United States Headquarters. Wright-Patterson, for many, many years, was the central repository of the, not only the hardware, but some of the little bodies and even some of the living crew members who had been retrieved. But it came, became very clear after a time that there wasn't enough room at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. We've literally filled up hangar after hangar with hardware. We're storing it now at at least three different Air Force bases, and much of it is being kept underground at a place in Nevada, not too far from Las Vegas, just beyond Nellis Air Force Base, which is repeatedly referred to as Dreamland, Groom Lake, or Site 51. That today is one of the largest repositories of hardware. Area 51 is 85 miles north, northwest of Las Vegas. There have been so many UFO sightings in this region that the government of Nevada recently named the stretch of road the Extraterrestrial Highway. The base is in remote desert, home to rattlesnakes, cows, and a few jackrabbits. Here, a handful of bureaucrats operate an unknown agency. Its existence was denied for almost 50 years, though the base was visible from Freedom Ridge and Whitesides Mountain Range. These sites were on Bureau of Land Management land. On April 10, 1995, the government incorporated this land into the base, putting it off limits to civilians. The 
use of deadly force is authorized. Anyone caught trespassing could be shot. On the 28th of January, 1996, former Secretary of Defense William Perry finally admitted the existence of the base. This was televised by Channel 13 in Las Vegas. We do have a military operation going on at Groom Lake, highly classified and highly important to U.S. security. Satellite photos of the base show the world's longest runway. The length is about 30,000 feet, almost six miles. Space shuttles could be landed at either end simultaneously, roll to a halt without brakes or parachutes, and still be separated by a mile. It is generally known that in the past, the base played an integral role in the development of several generations of U.S. spy planes. The U-2, the most sensational Cold War weapon. SR-71, otherwise known as the Blackbird. The B-2 Spirit the controversial invisible stealth bomber. rumored Aurora, a self-propelled aircraft said to have the abilities to penetrate the atmospheric envelope and return to Earth unaided. Nine miles south of the control tower of Area 51 lies Papoose Lake. Its dry lake bed can only be reached by dirt road. This is reportedly the site of nine heavily camouflaged hangars, alleged to contain several highly unconventional aircraft, described by those who claim to have seen them as flying saucer-like. According to several informed individuals, military and civilian, these aircraft were recovered UFOs. Reverse engineering, the process by which an advanced system may be used as a learning model for another, has given rise to these state-of-the-art aircraft. A great number and variety of people have come forward bearing witness to having seen them in flight over and around the base. Author and astronomer Chuck Clark has lived near the secret facility for the past four years, researching activity at the base for his remarkable Area 51 and S4 handbook. He watched the base from White Sides and Freedom Ridge with a high-powered telescope until it was closed to the public. I saw at first what I thought was an aerial illumination flare that was shot up from the area just south of the base at Area 51. Uh, it rose upwards from the hills and ascended to about 2,000 foot elevation and then hung motionless for several minutes. As it started uh, slowly descending, it got down about 30 or 40 feet above the ground and hovered motionless for a couple of minutes, or well, not a couple of minutes, maybe about a minute. And then suddenly it shot without warning all along the base of the hills over here to a point in front of the higher hills. It did that movement in about one to one and a half seconds. That is uh, just under five miles measured distance. 
and that makes the speed something between 9 and 14,000 miles an hour based on those times. After it hovered for uh, maybe four or five more seconds, it just vanished in place. But it did cast a glow on the ground, which means it wasn't a holographic projection. It wasn't a, a trick of some sort. Uh, it's unusual that you get something where, you know, I had range. Uh, I was able to figure the speed. The speed uh, calculated out to somewhere between 9 and a little over 14,000 miles an hour, depending on the, whether it was a second or a second and a half. That's the only estimate in the equation. Sightings of a similar object have been reported all over the world for many years. English pilot Michael Gardner was flying over Heligoland, Europe in 1975. Uh, I was in an aircraft very similar to this one. This is a 421, it was a 414. And uh, sitting there on autopilot, beautiful night, very, very clear. And all of a sudden I could see, I noticed a glow on top of the, the panel here, and it was a, a red glow, and I looked forward right up through here and somewhere above the aircraft was this red glowing ball and it was it was a dull red color it was like a burgundy color but it was very bright because I remember squinting the object stayed there probably for 15 or 20 seconds shortly afterwards it just accelerated ahead of me I mean just at extraordinary speed straight out ahead of the aircraft climbing turn and then just completely disappeared and uh, I talked to, I think I was with Amsterdam, talking to Amsterdam, and I called them, said, you know, do they have any contacts other than myself? And it was negative. Do they have any military activity? It was negative. Could you hear any engines or any sound? No engine? sound, no sound whatsoever. There was no effect on the aircraft. Uh, there was no wake. There was no nothing. They, they, it was a very cold night, uh, and, um, and that was it. You know, people need to... Uh give it some serious thought. Too many credible people have, have reported uh, things that are just impossible by our understanding of physics. Evidence suggests sightings are nothing new. Twenty to thirty thousand years ago, people drew remarkably accurate representations of mammoths, boars, and other animals on the walls of caves in what is now southern France and northern Spain. These same people also drew disc-like objects. French archaeologist Leroy Guerret cataloged these drawings. Here are some isolated images. Perhaps the trailing dots represent movement. Several unexplained flying objects appear in medieval art. This 10th century fresco is in a church in the former Republic of Yugoslavia. A man is at the controls of a pointed airship with what appears to be a jet blast at the rear. This French token, minted in the 1680s, seems to show a circular object floating in the sky. Italian friar Filippo Lippi painted this exquisite depiction of the Madonna, Jesus, and Saint John, circa 1500 AD. It hangs today in the Palazzo Vecchio Gallery in Florence, Italy. Over the Madonna's left shoulder flies an unidentified object. A man and his dog watch from below. discovery of extraterrestrial life have a devastating effect on organized religion? We spoke with professor of systematic theology, Ted Peters, at the Center for Theology and Natural Sciences in Berkeley, California. My answer to that is no, it would not. But it's an important question because there's a lot of disinformation about this being spread from two sources. And the first source is your kind of radical secular scientists who want to continue to believe the myth that religion is fragile, that religion is dogmatic and narrow, and so they tell this false information that religion is centered on Earth, it's centered on the human race, 
And uh, Carl Sagan would be a good example of someone who perpetuated this uh, belief because it always makes the scientist look like the great intellectual savior and that anybody who's religious is neurotic. Well, this is a complete misreading of both religion and uh, history. This issue was debated in ancient Greece even before the Jews and the Christians come on between the atomists on the one hand who argued that there were many worlds and that these worlds all had their organization, that reality was plural. When you get to Aristotle, who's really one of the dominant philosophers of ancient Greece, he says, no, there can only be one world, and he argued on the grounds of perfection, that perfect things are simple and they're unitary in character. Looking at liberal Protestants, and this is the area that we work with here in Berkeley, I can think of some of the most important theologians who've addressed it, such as Paul Tillich or Wolfhard Pannenberg, or a fellow by the name of Christer Stendahl, former dean of the Divinity School at Harvard and Bishop of Stockholm. Uh, Stendahl worked again on a NASA committee having to do with extraterrestrial life and said, you know, if we discover these beings in outer space, it'll just show me how big God's creation really is. Comparative religion scholar Joey Condon is one of those who feels differently. Religion as a whole is very Earth-centric. Uh, all of the religions are based themselves on the reality that we are alone. And basically the definition of philosophy and religion is humankind's search for their place in this universe. But in many ways that's not accurate because it's not the universe, it's this earth. The reality is, is that if an alien force comes here, the question naturally is, do they have a soul? Do they have a spirit? Theologically, within the Christian circles, that would next lead the question, did Christ have to die for them? Is original sin present in their being? Uh, if not, then do they have a soul? What are they? If Christ had to die for them, did Christ go and die on their planet, in another planet, in the other planet? There are multitudes of, of alien life forces. Or is this just a statement that, hey, there's a larger evangelistic mission field than we ever imagined, and we have to convert the masses? The larger philosophical issue is what about morality? What about politics? What about the way we get along as beings? Would they have discovered principles of harmony? Would they have as much crime as we do? Would they have the passions of jealousy, envy, and the things that cause so much destruction? Most of our theology and philosophy is not broad enough even to accept other faiths and other races within our own human family. Uh, I think we've seen that in the centuries of, of religious experience that, that we have had not as much tolerance as the man from Galilee who taught tolerance. Yet we have not had that amongst our fellow human beings. What then are we going to do with alien life forces? Many recent sightings have been recorded on film this photograph was taken by Jean Bedet in Albiasque, France in 1974. The light rays did not extend all the way to the ground and appeared to be retractable. This photograph was taken in Mexico in 1992. Like most photographs, authenticity is difficult to prove. However, this object has a shape and luminosity common to a great many descriptions. This object appeared over the city of Brussels on November 3rd, 1993. It was captured on film from several vantage points. A large number of witnesses agree that it was the size of a football field and maneuvered silently. It remained for several hours and has subsequently reappeared. Secretary General L. Clairbeau handles UFO sightings for the Belgian Air Force. He challenges governments to do a counter-investigation based on his research. If they do that, he says, they'll have to admit that UFOs are real. It's a trap, obviously. But we ask them to create a commission with university professors, senior scientists, whoever they wanted to come and review the material we've gathered, 
cross-examine any witnesses they wanted. Do their own investigation and draw their own conclusions. Of course, if they had accepted to do so, they would have come to the same conclusions as we did. And that's the trap. Far from accepting Mr. Clairbeau's challenge, the U.S. Air Force put out its third and final official explanation of the Roswell incident. They stated that what actually fell from the sky was a secret test balloon designed to detect Soviet nuclear blasts. They explained that the small alien bodies described by former military witnesses were actually six-foot-tall bluish dummies dropped from the sky in parachute impact experiments. Countries in Europe are taking this very serious. They're not like us here. They're not going to put out stories that there were dummies came out of the air or people with big heads. Those people are a little more serious about this than we are. Retired Colonel Philip J. Corso, a member of President Eisenhower's National Security Council and former head of the Foreign Technology Desk at the U.S. Army's Research and Development Department, recently came forward to reveal that he led a double life while in the military. On the outside, he researched and evaluated weapon systems for the Army. While deep inside the Pentagon, in his memoir, The Day After Roswell, he was responsible for the Army's most deeply guarded secret, the Roswell Files. I had the evidence that the, a crash did happen here. Stalin gave orders to get to this information that came out of Roswell to some of his top scientists and agents. That order went out, and we knew that and the special intelligence that I was in the Pentagon, which was very closely held, KGB trying to penetrate that, but they never did. According to Corso, the military seeded the industrial complex with components discovered in the wreckage near Roswell. He says that ultimately, these gave rise to today's integrated circuit chips, fiber optics, lasers, and stealth technology. The retired colonel recently made an appearance at the 50th anniversary of the Roswell incident, and when asked about criticism from skeptics, he responded. Now I ask him this, were you there with me? Were you part of this? Were you cleared? Did you have the clearances? They can't answer those questions. All they do is criticize with no evidence. The message in my book that I like to see is that the younger generation look at this and see what we did and see the help we got from outer space, and these beings exist. Give us information to the young people of the world in this country. They want to hear it. They want it. Give it to them. Don't hide it and tell lies and make stories. They're not stupid. It's their information. It doesn't belong to the Army or the Department of Defense. It's theirs. If it's classified, take the classification off and give it to them. One one Since his journey to the moon, Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell has met with high-ranking military officers from several countries who admitted involvement with alien technology and hardware. I talked with people of stature, of military and government credentials and position, and heard their stories and their desire to tell their stories openly to the public. Uh, and that, that got my attention very, very rapidly. The first-hand experiences of these credible witnesses that uh, now in advanced years are anxious to tell their story, we can't deny that. And the evidence points to the fact that Roswell was a real incident and that indeed an alien craft did crash and the material was recovered from that crash site. In early July 1947, Corso was post-duty officer in Fort Riley, Kansas. There, he claims to have seen a body transported from an airbase in New Mexico. I went back and there was five crates there, like five or six, I think it was five. I lifted one up and here's this body there in floating in fluid. First I thought it was a, a child, because it was small. Then I looked at this head and all. Right away. And this was only happened a matter of seconds. Then I put the end back down, and uh, the head was different. The arms were spindly. The body it was gray. So right at that moment, I figured, uh, I don't know what this thing is. 
So like an intelligence business, I just better put it in the back of my head here and wait till maybe in the future I get cooperation so I can evaluate what it is. Intelligence officer Jesse Marcel was one of the first to arrive at the crash site near Roswell, New Mexico in July 1947. I sense that it was, there was a cover-up someplace about this whole matter. How could a government, known for its inability to keep a secret, have maintained one of such magnitude for so long? What it hasn't maintained, it's been leaking out all over the place. But the way it's been handled is by denial, by, den by denying the truth of the documents that have leaked, by attempting to show them as fraudulent, as, uh, as bogus of some sort. Uh, it is, there has been a, a very large disinformation and misinformation effort around this whole area. And one must wonder how better to hide something put out in the open uh, than to just to say it isn't there. Uh, you're deceiving yourself if you think this is true, and yet there it is right in front of you. So it's a disinformation effort that is most concerning here, not the fact that uh, they kept a secret. They haven't kept it. It's been, it's been getting out into the public for 50 years or more. We have not been hiding anything. Evidently, there is a variety of UFO activity that is beyond the control of the U.S. Air Force, unless all those who have witnessed UFOs can be discounted. <laughs> Just extraordinary speed. We just saw flying saucer. And it just moved at that kind of rate right over my head. These kugeln verglühten in in the atmosphere. And then we just concluded very quickly that, that it was a UFO. While events such as mass suicide by cultists receive enormous publicity, the testimony and observations from credible individuals are essentially ignored. Whatever the answer may be, one thing seems certain. An observable physical phenomenon is taking place before our eyes, and those with the means to investigate are keeping the information from the general public.